strategic power of the commons from your perspective, Michel? Um, hello, <coughs> and thank you, thank you for inviting me. Um, I don't think I'm as known as Silke thinks, <laughs> uh, but I do recognize some faces uh, from other conferences, uh, and I, I'm really happy to, uh, to meet new people. And I think this is a great moment of convergence uh, between various movements which uh, did not talk as much as they should have before. And of course, one of the, the things I hope to come out of this conference is a dialogue between, uh, this is not pejorative, traditional commons uh, rooted in history and collective action of locally rooted people and the new digital commons of transnational value communities. And I think that the dialogue and the convergence between those two movements is the key to creating a new and powerful social movement uh, for the 21st century. Because I think we are, we are in a way we're dealing with two paradoxes. And I think the first paradox is the one ex expressed by, by Ruth, which is we have commons. We know they create wealth, but yet we have to acknowledge they've been on the defensive. They've been decaying and declining under the, under the onslaught of the global market. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there is another paradox, which is, I think is the, the paradox of contemporary financial capital, uh, which is the following. Um, most of us, I think, would say that, you know, one of the, the items of the crisis is that there is too much speculative capital, right? and it should go back to the productive economy. But I think we have to complexify that paradox a little more because really what's happening is uh, the feedback loop has been broken. That's the key issue. The key issue is actually that a lot of that speculative capital is real capital. It's capital that workers have created in the traditional industrial economy and for which they have gotten less and less a part of the pie. And it has created a surplus. And also, very importantly, because the digital commons, because the pollinization, as Jan Moulier Bouton, French economists say, through which we have extended the value of market value through common work, think about what would Google be worth if we hadn't produced the documents that it is representing to us? What would YouTube be worth if we hadn't produced the videos that they are representing to us? So this is a very key issue. The a paradox we are facing is that we have democratized the means of production, at least knowledge workers have to a certain extent, but we, had, we have not democratized the means of social reproduction of that value. This is a key issue that we need to solve if we move to another type of society. But I would argue that what we are doing in the digital commons, which I believe is on the offensive, and this is why it's so important compared to the traditional com commons. We are on the offense, offensive. We are creating new forms of value that are hyper-productive compared to traditional for-profit uh, strategies that uh, I think we can bring some solutions to the table. Um, what, okay, I want to so kind of argue that we are creating a new operating system in the sense that Peter Barnes uh, mentioned. And the first thing is, um, this is what you can see on the slide, is that uh, we are entering a third revolution in human productivity. The first revolution was the revolution of coercion, when we went out of the tribal uh, civilization into the kingdoms and the city-states uh, based on conquering uh, slave labor. The second revolution in human productivity occurred when we went from purely external motivation, fear, to the self-interest-based rational self-maximization theory of capitalism. We may like it or not, but it did create a huge leap in productivity, at least in production of material goods. But I think now when we look at the new digital commons, if we look at the way free software works, if you look at the way uh, free knowledge uh, communities work like the Wikipedia, if you look at shared design communities like Arduino, what we see is that we have a new method, a third revolution in human productivity based no longer on the division of labor, but on the distribution of tasks, on the self-aggregation, voluntary or paid, uh, of value creation through shared knowledge, 
shared code and shared design. And this has another consequence which I call peak hierarchy. Because I think one of the dramas of human history is that as long as we had high transactional costs, high communication and coordination costs, uh, when we grew, we had to hierarchize. There was no other way around it. We had to re-simplify human communication through hierarchy. In other words, even if we had good local ideas, if we remained small, we would be beaten by the big bad guys that were outside of us and big beats small. But if you look at Wikipedia today, what is it? Is it a centralized command and control hierarchy? No, of course there are hierarchies and issues in Wikipedia, but it's essentially a global mutual coordination of individuals and small groups that achieves the same, if not a higher productivity and efficiency than any for-profit centralized company could produce, right? So this is a really big shift in human history when we can globalize small group dynamics and small group dynamics can be much more democratic than centralized, big centralized entities. Another change I think is very important is that we have learned to recognize the difference between fields of abundance and fields of scarcity. I think even a classic NGO, as much as I like them, still operate very much with an idea of we live in a field of scarcity, we have certain resources, and we're going to decide how we're going to allocate those resources. This is not how digital commons function, right? If you look at, again, let's look at Wikimedia, Wikipedia or free software, what we have is a field of abundance where people are sharing their knowledge, their code and their designs. And it's reproducible at marginal cost. So you don't need a market because the market is about supply and demand. You don't need a hierarchy, which is also about allocating scarce resources, and you don't even need democracy. What you have is a plurarchy of possibilities. However, uh, let's say you are successful, as the Wikipedia is, and uh, millions of people start coming to your service, there you have a problem. You have a scarce physical infrastructure which needs to be ma managed and means need to be found to, to sustain them. But this is the field of scarcity that needs a democratic foundation, right? The Wikimedia Foundation or the Apache Foundation or all the foundations that are being created by these uh, new modalities. So at a micro level, I think we already have pretty much a vision of what the future looks like, right? I mean, slavery did not just magically transform into feudalism. Uh, feudalism did not magically transform into capitalism unless there were already previously established patterns that were working and that somehow got interconnected more and more. It's only when this new system was established and could no longer abide by the limitations of the older productive system that political revolutions would occur. And this happened in history that way, right? So this is what we are at the phase now. We're at the phase that we are seeing more and more patterns emerging. And like today, these patterns are starting to recognize each other and strengthen each other and form a, new, a, a core, new, a new logic. And the logic is very simple. If we look at free software and free hardware, it's at the core we have the commons, the commons of code or design. Uh, we have a community that either voluntarily or paid sustains that commons through collaborative platforms. Around it, we have entrepreneurial coalitions that are either classic businesses which adapt to the community norms because they have to, otherwise they can't work with the free software community, or even better, is when these value communities create their own means, create their own mission-oriented enterprises with new corporate forms that embed those very same values in their, very same, in their, in their own structure. And eventually, if we're lucky, around that, we have public authorities which see the value being created by these new dynamics and sustain empower and enable that social production to occur. And I would suggest that this micro logic that we see emerging is exactly the macro logic that we should look for in our society. In other words, the commons, civil society, autonomous production by civil society through commons is the core of the new civilization and the new political economy. Around that, we have a periphery of market-oriented enterprises 
co-ops, mission-oriented enterprises, social enterprises, the social economy, the solidarity economy, but that are no longer isolated like before, because this is a very important point. I like co-ops, I like traditional commons, right? But in the 19th century, Marx said, I think correctly, that they were dwarfish forms because they could not compete with globally coordinated capital, right? Well, this time is over. Now we can globally coordinate co-ops. We can globally coordinate the social, the social economy and the solidarity economy through digital commons. And we can do that better and more efficiently and more democratically than the classic for-profit forms. So finally, we need a partner state, which is not a traditional welfare state, which for me is still this uh, top-down idea of we take care of you. And we certainly don't need a corporate welfare state, which we have had since the 80s. We need a partner state which enables and empowers social production and social value creation to occur. And the key thing is we, so in, in other words, we have to do three things, right? We have to disembed the market from capitalism. We have to disembed market forms from global infinite growth. We can do that both through regulation from the outside, but we also have to do that from the inside, right? And this is where also a digital commons come in. I want to just to mention the example of Arduino as a digital uh, shared design community, which is quite successful, about $100 million in, in revenue. Um, Okay, I'm, I'm from the business world. I worked for 30 years for corporations. And as you know, what we do is we spend a lot of time innovating, and then we spend a lot of time making sure that innovation cannot be shared, right? And we design TVs that are scientifically designed to break down after 10 years. Everything in your TV is designed scientifically on purpose to break down concurrently, so that if you go for one thing, and they repair it, well, two weeks later, something else breaks down, and you've got to repair it, right? And after the third time, you say, well, I need a new TV, right? It's on purpose, because, um, and this is, I think, the difference between a market as a scarcity allocation system and capitalism as a scarcity engineering system, right? Terminator C's of Monsanto has nothing to do with allocating scarce resources. They are in the business of artificially creating scarcity where abundance reigns because nature does it by itself. So we need to deeply transform business, networks, and the state forms that we have. Um, now, I want to argue that this is not just a political issue, uh, like a top-down policy issue. This is very important. This is why we're here, okay, right? We are here because we want commons also to be a political voice and to start offering concrete answers to the institutional world to change and help us in the change. But I think there is a very important uh, bottom-up uh, aspect. I don't know how much I speak. Uh, I still have time? Okay. So I want to show you uh, a possible way to envisage change from the bottom-up. Just a moment. Yeah, I need to go through a few slides. I'm sorry. Uh, by the way, just, just very quickly, this is class struggle 3.0. So in other words, it's not just workers and capital vying for a piece of the pie. It's communities versus corporate platforms and entrepreneurial coalitions about the autonomy and the reproduction of the commons as a commons. This is the key issue. Yes, we work with entrepreneurs, but on what terms? Can, as they make, as they create value out of the commons, can they destroy and enclose the commons in the process? This is, a very, this is, the, this is the, the modern version of uh, the social tension in the new mode of production. Okay, I'm coming to what I wanted to show. So I'm gonna go very quickly uh, travel through a, a, a mind map that I made a few months ago, and its aim is basically to show you how much has already changed. How much has already been done by communities worldwide that prefigures this phase transition that I, I would like to see happening. The first thing I, I believe that needs to happen and is happening is a transvaluation, right? It's a deep change in cultural values. And, you know, as we saw slavery transforming into feudalism, yes, the Christians use some forms of the Christian state to organize their church, yes. But they were very, very different cultural values, right? Romans hated labor. Right? 
but Christian monks had to work. That was a key value. In other words, when we create a new civilization, we're not just continuing the old stuff and we do it better than that. No, no, we are doing something different. So we're not competing necessarily with them. We are creating something new based on a new value system. And I think each time that we see a system crumbling, dislocating, as we think we are witnessing today, we see that it's no longer able to answer the social needs and the social demands of the people, right? So the people starts an exodus. The slaves start, uh, start escaping the system, and they can no longer afford uh, the legions to do to keep the repression. The serfs in the 16th century started leaving the land and, and coming in the cities where they encountered the merchants. And today, who can ignore, at least in Europe, that about 30-40% of our youth lives in precarious circumstances and is no longer getting any answer or, f or promise for the future from the existing system. Okay, So we have the, the premises of a deep cultural change. I just want to mention very briefly one proof of that. It's called the Edelman Trust Barometer. Five years ago, 78% uh, of the people in Western countries and China would say, I trust institutions. And 18% would answer, trust people like myself. Today, in 2007, four years later, 2003, 2007, 70, 80% of the people answer, I trust people like myself. So in other words, there is a cultural transformation from a vertical vision producers versus consumers, and we trust providing institutions to a, a horizontal view of the world, a peer-to-peer -peer view of the world as people seen in co-producing value together. Okay, so what we do next? Very quickly, and this is something James Quilligan, I don't see where you are, but I suppose you're here, uh, or maybe you're coming. Oh, all right, James. So James will talk about that. Social charters. So what did the serfs who came to the new city-states and encounters the guilds and the merchants, what did they do? They ask for new social charters. They ask for new rights and freedoms. The general public license, which is the constitution of the free software movement, is not just a contract, it's a social charter. It says, if you want to work with us, there are five rules you have to abide by. If you don't abide by those five rules, you do not work with us, right? So this is a very clear social charter conditioning social cooperation on a new basis, on a new value basis. Okay, once we do that, uh, what do we do? Well, we embed them. We embed those social values in infrastructures. When we have a bar camp, or when we had the Kropdorf uh, consultations, uh, we had a, a bottom-up approach, self-organized approach to meeting, right? This is a new, infrastructure of meetings which has a new value system embedded, which is different from the old, right? And we're doing this with shared code, shared design, and shared knowledge. We are creating on a vast scale these uh, new infrastructures. So wh what do we do next? Once we have it, uh, we go to what I call a domains of practice, right? So we, we, ac we what we do is we change our values we create new social charters, we embed them in infrastructures that we work with, and we apply them to our domains, open education, open business, open politics, open data, right? These are domains of practice in which we use these platforms and infrastructures. Which then, uh, so practice are applying domains and eventually uh, uh, get social artifacts. And of course I would argue to kind of close the circle once we start using those new methods, those new platforms, those new infrastructures, we change. Even if we don't want to, right? When the Templars invented global banking and some other monk, I forgot who that was, invented double bookkeeping, the feudal lords didn't need double bookkeeping, right? They got it from the, from the serfs and they had their parties and their uh, medieval uh, fights. Um, but once you started using double bookkeeping, you discover, oh my God, I'm spending too much money, right? It changed their consciousness. As people are using more and more these virtual platforms based on new ways of cooperating on a peer-to-peer -peer basis, we are changing human awareness and human consciousness, which creates new movements 
which creates new values, which creates new social charters, which creates new infrastructures, and, and the circle goes on. I think this is what we are doing. And I think we need, if we are part of this new emerging world, we need to ask three questions. Am I over time? Is this the end? Yes? yes? Okay, three questions. Three questions and Invite one answer. Invite the public okay. to answer your questions. Yes. Three questions and one, one of my own answers. Okay, three questions. How do we, in this new world, where the new, for me the new thing is v uh, transnational socialization around affinity. This is what, what the internet brings on board, right? Okay, three questions. As we create these new communities and these new artifacts, like free software, how do we make a living in the existing world with the existing logic we, we have, which we have not chosen and we may not like, but we have to do somehow find a way. The second question is, how can we, parallel with that, connect with other players in the same ecology, in the same new value sphere, and develop new practices using new types of currencies, new types of exchanges, which do not reflect the old value system. This is the second question you need to ask yourself. And the third question is, how do we escape? How can we go beyond monetary exchange altogether? Are there things we can do, like couch surfing, for which we do not need money, but we can simply share an exchange with each other without having to enter the classic economy? If we have an answer to those three questions, we can create sustainable value communities, which can be allied to traditional commons, right? If you have a fair trade cooperative using a commons, allied with its distributors and its, and its users abroad, you have a transnational value community which can become sustainable. So I think this is the kind of new core of the world that we are looking for. We, we, yes, we need to change the state, we need to change the market, but we also need to devise our own forms, new forms, to make uh, this new value system sustainable over time. Thank you very much.